to do now. Oh, so, uh, people are still uh, messaging to join Diane. So I'm going to, I'm just messaging them to you. Okay, I've got it. Okay, and Tariq Bashir is coming in. And yeah, just as we, I just forward them all to you and we are going to record it and we are going to introduce Kathy. Now. I don't need this one. Right, so I'd like to welcome everybody today to our webinar. We're very excited that you are joining us. And um, we wanted to have time with Kathy to be able to talk to her about all the issues that dentists are facing. And um, just a small note to tell you a little bit about Kathy, if you don't know. Um, Kathy is the founder of Jamison Management. It's an international dental management company. And um, I've been working with Kathy for nearly 25 years. And um, everything that I have learned about practice management, I've learned from Kathy. I've been a good student. I have implemented, uh, um, I've implemented everything that she tells me. And um, I'm keen to learn more and hear more about what she has to say today. Kathy has been named one of the top 25 women in dentistry, and she's been a recipient of the second Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Dental Office Association of Practice Management. <clears throat> Kathy has been listed in, as a leader in the CE um, by Dentistry Today, especially in the year 2020, which is a big achievement. She considers herself a lifelong learner and encourages those around her to be in constant um, in constant learning. So I'm going to hand you over to Kathy and um, welcome and thank you very much for joining us from Oklahoma. Thank you, Dr. Greenwald. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you who are joining us today to discuss a very important issue for all of us around the world as we struggle with and face and deal with the pandemic of the COVID-19 virus. This is, this is impacting 184 countries, minimally, and it's not anything that any of us it, it, invited into our world, into our lives, into our dental practices, but here it is. So in the United States and around the world, while I'm in the United States, I've had the privilege of consulting and lecturing in 31 countries. Most of the countries of, of the people that are being represented here on this, on this webinar, I've been in your countries and have had the privilege of working with people just like you. So the things that I'm gonna share with you today are not things that are just practicalities that are appropriate in the United States. I can promise you they're practical in your country as well and in your practice. And as Dr. Greenwald just said, I've been working with her and other members of the Jamison management team in her practice and many, many, many other practices in the United Kingdom for over 25 years. In fact, we had an entire division in the United Kingdom for a long period of time. So, I wanted to share that with you so that you know that we have been hands-on in your country as well as in my own country. Success strategies for the COVID-19 dental practice. Let's talk about that. COVID-19 is here. It has not gone away. It is on its way down on the downward side of the curve in certain countries. In certain countries, it is not. In the United States, there are areas in the country where we are on the downward curve. In certain parts of the country, practices are opening up. In certain parts of the country, whether it be a city or an entire state, practices have opened up. In certain uh, areas, no, in fact, so cities within a state, they are not opened up. And there, uh, as Dr. Greenwald and I were talking, in the United Kingdom, the, the practices are not opened up yet. So what I'm gonna share with you today are things to be thinking about now while you may still be shut down, things that you can be working on now, but also things to be focusing on as you begin to open up. And in some of you that are on the webinar, you are beginning to open up. So again, this is for the now and for the yeah. very near future. So let's look at some yeah. strategies for that. Um, uh, and, and let's, let's look at this. This is my husband, Dr. John Jameson. He, uh, 
a, a, a dentist. And so this is, again, I wanted to share this with you. These, the things I'm going to share with you are things that we have done in our own practice. And uh, he has practiced dentistry for 30 years. So nothing that I'm going to share with you is okay. not things that we have not done in our very own practice. So I helped get him through dental school, uh, worked in his practice as a clinical assistant and as his business administrator. So I'm very hands-on in this world of dentistry, and uh, this is very practical, and you need that. You need practical work now. I'm going to change this from six ways to stabilize your practice during and after the COVID pandemic, and I'm going to discuss five with you. I, I may dive into the six, but I want to focus on five particular things right now. Um, first of all, communication, hygiene, financing, scheduling, and marketing. And again, the sixth, if I get to that, I'll, I'll give you a sixth sort of a bonus at the end. The success of your practice is going to be in direct proportion to the success of your systems. And so everything in your practice is a set of systems. You have technology systems, you have management systems, you have communication systems, systems and you have clinical systems. Everything in your practice is made up of systems. The systems are the protocols by which you run things. Uh, again, if you think about it, whether it's your, as I have just mentioned, your scheduling systems, your financing systems, your hygienic systems, your communication systems, everything is how you do things from step one, step two, step three, step four. Everything you do is a set of systems. The gurus of man of management say base your business upon good systems where you set a system up based on what you want to accomplish get mm -hmm. that system set up excellently so that you get the kind of results that you want base your practice on good systems then you train people teach people educate people your team members how to administer those systems and how to administer those systems excellently have the systems so profoundly solid in your practice that if someone leaves your practice that your practice doesn't fall apart people will come and people will go we all know that life happens to people people get transferred people move people become ill people get pregnant and they don't come back things happen life happens so there are some issues in the practices right now where certain people on practices are not wanting to come back to the practices i must admit to you i did not anticipate this would happen as much as it is happening now again the united states is opening up germany's opening up certain other countries are opening up the united kingdom is not yet but australia is opening up and one of the things i did not anticipate and this is not 100 percent, but there are certain people certain members of the team who are not wanting to come back and there's there's some reasons for that they may not have child care they may have a member of their family who is ill or somebody who is mature or who has a cyst who has problems in their own physical health and well-being that they need to take care of them and they can't come back there are reasons there are reasons or their own fears and people are not coming back like i thought they would so there's a hole in the team. So those issues happen. You have to have those systems set up so that the practice can continue even though someone who may have been administering a part of the system, doesn't. the practice doesn't fall apart due to a change of persons. People come and go, you have to have your system steadfast. The right hand of your practice needs to know what the left hand of your practice is doing and vice versa. So this is a critical time for you to really focus on every one of your systems. And this is a good time to look at your clinical systems too. Are there some things in your clinical arena that you wanted to add to your practice that maybe you haven't had the time or felt like you had the time to add that dimension to your practice? Well, this might be a good time to do that. Was there a piece of equipment that you wanted to add to your practice? Or maybe you have a piece of equipment that you're not using to its fullest extent that you feel like you could use more em emphatically? This would be a good time to figure out ways to do that. So use the time when you may not be seeing patients and do some Zoom meetings with your team. If you are allowed to do that, check on your 
HR laws and see if you can do some Zoom meetings with your team, make sure that that's acceptable in your, in your country and in your area, and do some training with your team on how you can do everything you're doing a little bit better. This is a great time to make sure that your systems are great. Ask yourself these two questions. Look at the systems of your practice and ask yourself, what are we doing well? And pat yourselves on the back and say, let's make sure that we keep on doing those things that are going well. Don't let things fall through the cracks. Even if you do have some changes of team, I hope you don't, but if you have some changes of team, make sure that you don't let the things that are going well in your practice fall through the cracks. It's critical that you maintain, maintain status quo, maintain things that are healthy and not let things waver. You don't want to come back to a practice that has holes in it. So this is a question to ask yourself. Look at the systems of your practice, every single one of them, and there's about 25 major systems, believe it or not, in your practice and ask yourself, what things of those systems are going well. We want to make sure we're doing those things well. But ask yourself a more critical question, and that is, and this is, by the way, a more productive question. That's a very important word. How can we do everything that we're doing even better? And I would promise you that no matter how well you're doing, whatever it is you're doing, you can do everything that you're doing even better. Dr. Greenwald, I'd like to ask you this question. We've worked together for 25 years, and every time I come to your practice and we work together, you have a stellar team. You have some of the best team members that I've ever had the privilege of working with, and you and your other doctors are stellar. But when we work together, have you found that everything we work on, we find ways to improve upon those systems? Have you found that to be true? Absolutely. So every time, every time we do the training, we, um, we find ways to improve. And the, the key thing is to, for us to work as a team to follow your systems and to follow through. There may be a question about what are the systems, Kathy? And we have got that in our book. And I'm hoping that um, people who are attending today can, um, can sign up to buy the book at um, either from you or from me, but um, a, a lot of what we're discussing today is in our textbook, and we worked yes. very hard to produce it and publish it in 2011. There are only a few copies left, so um, people may ask for handouts. There's already been one question when you said, what are we doing well now, and what should we be doing at this time? There's a question about websites because they, um, this is from Aram. Aram is worried that, like you said, people won't want to come back. So besides the staff members who may not want to come back, patients may be too scared to come back. Yes. And what would you suggest about working with our website at the moment to improve that? Yes, for and, and if I may, security? I, yes, I appreciate that question. And if I may ask, permission to hold that question. I have an entire section on the website and I have some slides on that. So if I may ask permission to hold that question, I'm going to deal with that specifically because that's a very good question and I'm going to address that specifically because that's a very good question because we want to, I want to address how to help our teams maintain themselves as well as our patients. So may I do that? Sure, sure. Let's okay, carry on. Thank you. So, and I appreciate that question because it's a critical question and one of the one of the things we want to do is communicate communication skill is the bottom line to your success so we want to stay in touch with the team stay in touch with patients and stay in touch with your guides and what I, what I mean by staying in touch with your guides is that staying in touch with everybody on your in your world who you turn to for advice that would be your uh, laboratory your the people who are providing you with your uh, with your supplies, people who your your management coaches, whoever it is that is guiding you and and your trusted mentors, you want to stay in touch with them. Things are changing all the time. Stay in touch with your CPAs, your financial guides, your uh, HR people. Everything changes constantly. We at Jameson Management stay in touch with all of those advisors, and then we're providing materials to our 
not only to our client base, but also to the world at large. You can all go to the Jameson Management website, www.jameson, J-A-M-E-S-O-N, management.com, and there is a resource page, and there are tons of resources. Now, they're available to you at no, at no fee, and you can go to that resource page. Now, what I will tell you is that oftentimes, the materials that are there will change by the next day because guidelines will change. I will also tell you that there will be different guidelines put forth by the different guiding bodies per country. For example, the American Dental Association will put out guidelines for infection control, sterilization, et cetera, that may be different from the British Dental Association or the Australian Dental Association. So you wanna make sure that you're staying in touch with your associations to make sure that you are in touch with what they are mandating. And because things are changing because of the changing science daily, uh, you wanna stay in touch with them. I know that our, our state and federal associations are changing that daily and so we try to stay in touch with them continuously but so you want to stay in communication with everyone because among your team and with patients how well you communicate communicate will help you keep your patient base and generate new patients it's going to be imperative that you stay in touch with your patient base right now they're they're just as nervous and just as frightened about contacting this virus as anybody else. Now they're anxious to come back to the dentist because they have been away from the dentist for a long time and they want to come in for care, but they also need to know that, that they're going to be safe. New patients are going to be coming in as emergencies, but they still need to know that they're going to be safe. So spreading that word and going back to the question about the website and everything else that you're doing, which I'm going to deal with, that you need to be upfront, probably more profoundly than anything else, talking about what you're doing to protect them, their families, you and your families from COVID-19. So look at this. Here's why right now we believe that people are not going to seek dental care. Now, this would be your existing patient family or anybody that is seeking a new dentist. And the number one thing is fear. Now, this is not, has not been the number one reason historically in the recent two decades that people have not come to the dentist, but it is now. And it's not fear of the dentistry itself, it's fear of COVID-19. And so with whatever you're doing in your marketing, and again, I'm gonna deal with marketing, but whatever you, every single piece of information you put out, and you need to do this regularly, three to five times a week, you need to be in contact with your patient. That's why social media is so critical. That's why what you're doing on your website is so critical. You wanna be in touch with people in a constructive, positive way, letting them know what you're doing in a proactive, gentle, well, proactive in general, that doesn't sound like it goes together, but it, but it can, a proactive way to protect them because you wanna offset their fear, their fear and their anxiety. The fear and the anxiety will prevent people from moving. It just freezes people in place. So again, if they can know what you're doing, I, I myself went to a medical wellness evaluation this week but they were very safe. They sent me a telephone number. I got to the parking lot, called before, as soon as I got there, they called me on that number. Only then did I go in. They took my temperature. They, I, I did the, hand, the sterilization of my hands. Then they did some questions of me. There was nobody in the reception area. They took me immediately back to a, a room. All the paperwork had been done digitally before I got there. Everything was done very pristinely but nobody was freaking out. It was just done so carefully and so precisely. I felt very, very, very safe. And they asked me to bring my own mask. I did, everyone was masked. So it was just the way. So while it was different than it had ever been before, and this was just a wellness exam, and you, you, you could say to me, well, then why did you go? It wasn't an emergency, you didn't have to go. I felt safe in going. And so, 
and and things that opened up and this and so I I went and I, I was not afraid and it was it was fine to go. You need to pr present that message to your patients, whether it's your hygienic patient, an, an emergency patient, and for those of you in many countries, your first patient's coming back, or you may be seeing emergencies now. In the United States, from the March 16th shutdown until now, in in certain areas, things are starting to open up. The only patients dentists could see were emergencies, and the American Dental Association identified what was an emergency, what could be seen. Most dentists complied with that. I will tell you some did not, but their licenses were at risk if they did not comply. We recommended that they comply with the guidelines of the American Dental Association and the state dental associations um, for the safety of their patients, for the safety of themselves and of their team members, and because that was the regulations of their governing bodies. Um, we felt like that was the ethical thing to do. Um, those were, those guidelines and the CD, our CDC, Centers for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health, and the federal government. It, it, was, the, it was the thing to do. But, and, the, and it, it was uh, appropriate. Now things are opening up with caution and with care. And that's the way we're going to offset fear. The, the other thing that we have to be aware of with our patients is the cost. Now that's an issue for you too. You've been shut down. You have had perhaps some government assistance, depends on the country, and uh, you've perhaps had some government assistance to pay some staff, to pay bills, rent, supplies, you get utilities. You may have had some government assistance. Hopefully you had an emergency fund. We've always recommended from Jameson Management because of the advice from our financial people to have a to have a minimum of three months of your overhead in an emergency fund. Now, that's what's recommended, but it's also very hard to do, but that's the recommendation. But a lot of people don't do that, but nevertheless, hopefully you've had some emergency funding. However, it's still been very costly to shut your doors during this time frame, And if you did not have government funding, paying your team to keep them on board, if you were required to do that, or if you did that, it was costly. And it's going to be costly to open up and not be opened up fully and completely. So you're going to have some cost issues in your own practices. So, um, and so are your patients, because some of your patients have either been, are out of work or they're working part-time. They've had financial issues as well. Therefore, I'm going to talk about costs. Can we talk a little bit about the costs? I'm sorry. Well, what I'm I want sorry. to do is, that's okay. Talk about the extra costs, and I know you, you're going to talk about handing um, a PPE cost, a, a cost of the sterilization equipment yes. on the patient, and especially because you've taught us to have initial exam patients know the fee. And then you do need to do an evaluation and then you can do a treatment planning discussion. But the problem is that um, a lot of the treatment planning discussions will now be online and yes. payments will be prepayments and payments will be electronic. And we need to, um, you know, all the systems need to deal with that and patients need to know upfront costs and especially emergency patients going forward and emergency new patients. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think what you said is, is absolutely perfect. The, in my opinion, the, there is going to be additional PPE cost. So if I were any of you, I would do my very best, work with your supply people, and to the best of your ability, calculate what your cost per patient is going to be, to the best of your ability. Uh, you may be, that may be changing over time, so the, your cost may change over time as well. But figure up what you're going to be adding in terms of filters, uh, uh, whether you're going to wear, what kind of barriers you're going to have, whatever additional costs or whatever costs you're encumbering now, plus additional costs, try to try your best to figure up what that's going to cost per patient. And either take your fees up per patient by, you know, you can take your fees up X amount of, of pounds or whatever your, your, or dollars or whatever your, and whatever your 
dollar amounts are, your m numerical numbers are, um, and take your fees up by a little bit per procedure, that would probably cover your cost. That is a way. Or you can just charge a fee for infection control. Yes. Either, either way, in my opinion, is acceptable. Now, some of the governing dental bodies are considering, some of the dental governing bodies are considering adding a code to their, to their, to their codes for infection control. That's slow in coming, but it may come. And if they do, I think that I think they should, and I hope they do. We shall see that. Follow up on that and see if that happens. But uh, I have one client in uh, in the United States who's who is charging every time a person comes in. They have a credit card on file. They get a credit card on file, and they charge. And the person walks in that that fee is charged no matter what they let the people know that they are proud of what they're doing they've put they've dressed themselves in their ppe they've put it on social media they're proud of what they're doing i think they should be proud of what they're doing they let people know how well they are barrier protected for themselves as well as for their patients and they're they're very graciously they have practiced the verbal skills that they're using to help people understand how carefully they are protecting their patients and and they are charging for that they're filing a fee for that and so far and they've well they've only been open a week now but they have had no complaints the patients are glad to know that they're being protected and they don't mind paying a fairly small amount for the amount of protection that they're getting that they're also getting stellar care so one goes hand in hand. Now, in terms of the uh, new patients coming in, you don't know those these patients. I think it's okay to let them know what the fee will be. I think it's okay to get a credit card on file to, for that new patient coming in. Uh, if this is somebody you don't know, to let them know that there is a fee, what the fee will be approximately for the new patient experience. Mm -hmm. Don't go ahead with any care on a patient beyond that new patient experience until that patient's very clear and comfortable on what the fee would be for treatment to be provided. One of the most, one of the things that patients like the least about a dentist is not knowing how much something costs before it's done. They don't say you're too expensive. They don't say you're not worth it. They don't say that. They say, please let me know how much something costs before it's done. Okay, well, that's easy to do. We can always inform a person of their financial responsibility prior to the rendering of care. So we let them know how much something's going to be. We ask their, we ask their permission to, pro, to pro, proceed and then we ask their permission to charge them this much fee for that and then we also get uh, not only the permission for the total investment but also we find out their preferred method of payment and once we're clear about that and they're clear about that there's going to be a much better relationship the clearer you can be about the relationship not only about the treatment but also about the fee the better the relationship will be and again I want to I want to talk a little bit about methods of payment that you can make available to your patients that are good for you but good for your patients it's in my opinion the better you the better the win win the more emphatic the win win in the cost issue the better the relationship will be so be be careful about this cost issue you want the cost to be a win win another reason that people don't seek dental care is a lack of trust again uh, a relationship dentistry i think you'll all agree is a, is a relationship business so sometimes people don't go ahead with treatment because of a lack of trust so the better our communication the better the trust but also this trust issue is yes it's about do i need this is this what's best for me all behavior of all human beings is driven by what's in this for me is this what's best for me is this what you would do if it were you and so we want to build a level of trust and confidence with our patients no one will ever purchase your product or service and of course for us they're purchasing our service the service of dentistry
And no one will ever purchase our service of dentistry unless they have a level of trust and confidence with the dentist, but also with every member of the team. The oral cavity, of course, is an intimate zone of a human being's body to be handled with the ultimate care and, and concern. But so is the pocketbook. It's a very personal part of a human being's life. And so we want to trust that. They, they want to trust us before we have conversations about financing. So when we're talking about building trust and confidence with our patients, it's not just building trust and confidence with our clinical team. It's building trust and confidence with the business team as well. It's everyone on the team, every single person on the team has an imperative role in this thing we call trust. So this is as important today as it's ever been. Another reason people may not seek dental care now and may not have in the past and may not in the future is no perceived need. So they have no sense of urgency. Well, if, if it doesn't hurt or if it isn't broken, I can put this off because it isn't really imperative and I wanna wait until there's no such thing as a coronavirus. Well, you want to really refine your educational skills based on communication to help people see the value of preventive dentistry, of their hygienic appointments, of taking care of dentistry diagnosed but incomplete. Think about this. If you diagnosed something, something is going on. Something is not as healthy as it could be or needs to be, or you wouldn't have diagnosed it, hopefully. You wouldn't have prescribed treatment, and you wouldn't have done a treatment plan and placed it in the patient's record. So if, it, if there's dentistry diagnosed but incomplete, then something needs to be done. If there's a new area of concern since the last time the patient was seen, if they have periodontal concerns, and we know that periodontal disease is an inflammation, ha has been proven through the science, to be related to, or can be related to, other issues within the human body, heart disease, diabetes, cancers. We need to get that periodontal disease in control. There are perhaps restorative, historical restore, restorations that have served their purpose well and now are leaking, and perhaps there's decay underneath. I don't need to tell you why coming in for hygienic appointments is not simply to have the teeth cleaned, although that's important, but there's so many other things that we identify in terms of imperative dental issues when we can have those patients coming in for hygiene and for that imperative diagnostic appointment with the doctor. So, Kathy, can, I can I interrupt you a little bit? Um, because we have always discussed about doing a hygiene exam and yes. we can't have any more 10 minute appointments to pop in to the hygiene room because we have to put our full scrubs on and our whole gear and outfit and all the appointments are longer. So I'd like to hear your opinion on yes. that. One yes. is we have an excellent question from Dr. Elaine Halley in Scotland yes. and she says, Please, um, can you give some tips about communication, communicating with your masks on? Because we've got all this gear on our face and um, how are we going to communicate well? Perhaps we're in the middle of a procedure and we realize we need to do a root canal. How are we going to, we can't take everything off because we're in the middle of a procedure now. So things are different. We, we need some skills, some guidance on how to communicate when you've got a, a, a visor, a mask, a hat, and everything else on. Absolutely. Dr. Halley, it's great to, great to hear from you. Uh, love you so much. Thank you so much for, for the question. And as you know, because we've worked together so beautifully, that we want that, that eye contact and we want that facial communication. And now uh, you're right. Covering our faces completely takes away from one of the most important communication skills, and that is body language and eye contact is so critical. 60% of, of all communication is body language and we are covered from head to toe. And we have no choice about that right now. So the best we can do is the best we can do. I think the first thing I would say to a patient is, is Mrs. Jones, right now I'm so uncomfortable because I have so much I wanna to say to you and I feel like I'm totally, uh, 
covered up and I, you can't see me as well as usual and I can't see you as well as I usually do. I have so many things I need to say to you. So I'm going to apologize, but there's nothing I can do because my first goal is to protect you and to protect myself and my family and your family. So I know we both agree that that's our most important priority right now. But let me ask you, can you hear me well? <laughs> and so what I'm doing, what I'm doing with that opening statement, Elaine, is I'm getting in connection with her. I want to connect with her. I want to let her know that the purpose, and she already knows, but I'm going to say it again, that the purpose behind it is in her best interest. I want to connect, connect, connect. And then I'm going to say, and then I also said to her, I have something very important to share with you but I want to make sure you can hear me because even though she can't see me, I want to make sure she can hear me. Now, only 11% of learning takes place auditorially. So we're taking away 60% of learning takes place visually. I mean, I mean with, with body language, 30% is the tone of my voice though. So, you know, I've got to make sure that I can do my best with the tone of voice. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to do the best I can. And then the rest is the, where the words I speak. Now, here's another thing is we're going to use our visual aids. So this is another power, powerful tool is this is where your photography is going to speak for you. So we, we don't have our face, but we have our photography. So open the conversation with a statement about the purpose. Uh, and it may be a, a repeat. That's okay. This, a statement of, of the purpose behind it speak it in terms of benefiting the patient, get in communication with her, turn to the photography and use the photography. And that's really the best you can. That's the best you can do. Uh, this will hopefully be over sometime, <laughs> maybe never, maybe never. But I would say that's the best that we can do. Now, Dr. Halley, uh, tell me if that answered your question or, or see if you have another question related to that. Uh, no, Kathy, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, I, the, the add-on question I would have to that is should we be moving financial conversations into the virtual world so that we can see people like this via a Zoom? Like, should we be, you know, taking anything other than the very simple conversations, you know, and making an online appointment with the patient so that we can share a screen? That, that's a great question. That's a great question. We believe that, and, and, and to tell you the truth, Elaine, we we really believe that a lot of the, even before there was such thing as a coronavirus, we have found that a lot of the consultations have gone to digital because of uh, surveys of some of the major marketing and research companies have shown that because convenience and time are such a major issue for people in today's world, everywhere in the world, that people don't want to come back. Although we still believe face-to-face -face consultations are the very best. If people can't or won't come in for the face-to-face -face consultations, we've moved to doing more and more digital consultations keeping in mind still using photography and the good verbal skills and everything that you know we've taught for so many years but all the same parameters but but doing them digitally the clinical as well as the financial so now in this world yes i think a lot of the clinical as well as the financial will need to be digital um i still think if a patient is in the office and you can do a face-to-face -face or semi-face-to-face -face, um, consultation financially, I think that's still best. Keep the six feet, have the, have the monitor with the photography. It, you know, if, if I'm doing the financial presentation and I ask, I know Dr. Halley asked if you had any questions, Mrs. Jones, and sh you said no, but I thought there might be some questions you'd like to ask of me. And she asked me some questions about the treatment that you've recommended. I wanna go back to the monitor if I can. And I wanna reconfirm the benefit of the treatment and answer her questions because all clinical questions need to be answered before the discussion of money takes place. And I'd like to get the confirmation of the, of the financing right then when she's on our turf, if I can. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, Kathy. That's yes. very helpful. Now, Elaine, if I can't get that done, my second best choice would be 
to do a Zoom meeting and do it digitally once the patient is home. Okay. But the, but the, but the non-answer, the, non, the thing that's not acceptable is not to follow up and follow through with either the clinical or the financial or both. Not following up and not following through is not an acceptable answer. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Good to hear one from more you. question. One more question to follow up. If we normally used to do separate consultations in, like you say, we have to be six feet away. Um, and the spaces in the UK, the, the consultation rooms are small. We are converting our waiting room into a room where we can place our PPE and um, take it off and place it on because our offices almost need to be redesigned for this new way. So yes. what we're talking about also is how we communicate with a patient. If we've got to do, we, let's say we're in our operatory and um, we've got to communicate something that's happened and we want to show them photos and all that, we need to stay in the operatory. We can't move them out because there's nowhere else to talk because of the COVID. So we're going to need to um, think about how we're going to deal with emergency situations as well and what we're going to do. Yes, gonna, the scheduling is gonna be totally different. Uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me move quickly to that if I may. Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move through this um, because I wanna see if I can get to scheduling real fast. I, I I've already talked about hygiene. That's why I'm moving, I'm gonna move through hygiene because we all know about hygiene. You, how important this is. Now, payment options, uh, I can c maybe come back to this, but let me get to scheduling since you brought that up. So I'm doing this, beloved ones, to get to scheduling. I'll see if I can come back to financing. Okay, so here's scheduling. So in answer to your question, Dr. Greenwald, number one, you gotta have the proper equipment and, and, and instruments as we all know, but you're gonna have to schedule longer appointments, everyone. You're gonna, and you're gonna, and, and one of the things you need to do is try to do more dentistry per appointment on fewer patients in a day. You can't see a whole lot of patients because it's gonna take longer to do everything because as Dr. Greenwald just said, you're gonna be doing, uh, it's gonna take longer to do infection control and it's going to take longer to sterilize and you may be doing the explanation of treatment in the treatment room depends on your facility you may not be able to move somebody out if you don't have a space to move someone out for the explanation of treatment if you have a space to move somebody out of a treatment room to have the explanation of treatment done by a treatment coordinator where they can explain the treatment where they have a monitor and they can then do the financial arrangement, great. If you don't have that, they may have to stay in the treatment room longer. Um, now, I know you all know, like I mentioned earlier, have patients text when they arrive, text, you, text then you text them when, they are when you're ready for them. You, you gotta do that. Um, digitize your patient information sheets and health history forms and send them to the patients prior to their appointments. You have hand sterilizers outside your door and with tissues and then take their temperatures. You know how to do all that. That's going to take time. Everything's going to take more time. Pre-block, pre -block, if you're not already pre-blocking, pre-block your schedule so that you know that you're going to have times in your days for emergencies. And, and Dr. Greenwald, in response to that question about emergencies, pre-block your time for emergencies so all of you go back into your history before this all started and see approximately how many emergencies you have in a day and try to pre-block about that amount of time so that you have that approximately that much time in your day and how much time you need to at least see the patient you know, do all the prep work that i just got, i just described get that patient seated do a necessary radiograph you know, get them robed and all the stuff you have to do, get that, get the radiograph and, and do a diagnosis. Now you may get them palliatively comfortable and rescheduled for necessary care, at least. Get them palliatively comfortable and get rescheduled for necessary care. You may not do any treatment that day, reschedule them for the necessary care. Because you don't wanna 
you don't want to mess up your schedule by providing extensive care on an emergency patient if you've got somebody else scheduled right behind them. One of the other things that people do not like about the dentist is waiting. Well, you don't want to um, cause a regularly scheduled patient to sit there and wait for an hour while you take care of an emergency. So again, see the emergency. If you determine they are truly an emergency, that they must be seen that day, see that patient, get them in, provide palliative care, and reschedule them for the necessary time frame. Now, if you have time, because you don't have another patient, and you have the time to provide care without that having a negative impact on your regularly scheduled patient, well, great, provide the care of that day. Super, that's, that's a great thing to do. No problem, no problem. But again, pre-blocking has always been critical, but it's more critical today than ever before. Try to pre-block some what we call primary procedures. Those are your those are your higher value procedures, crowns, bridges, inlays, onlays, Invisaligns, whatever it is that you're doing, endo, whatever your specialty may be, uh, whatever, whatever. Whatever your higher valued procedures, try to do about half your production goal. Try to do about half of your production in those higher valued procedures in a day. And then nestle around those, some of your smaller procedures. And then you'll be able to have fairly productive days, smoother days, and you'll be able to um, pay your bills. If I may say that, that, that straightforwardly, you gotta, pay, you gotta pay your bills, but you want smoother, you want smooth days where you can see your patients, see them expediently, give yourself enough time. So again, the other thing you need to do is and this sounds very tedious, but in these few days, in these days leading up to, and certainly after you come back to work, do some time and motion studies. That sounds very laborious, but be realistic, people. Do some time and motion studies and figure out how long it's going to take you to do some of the procedures the way you're going to need to do them with the new um, sterilization and infection control and, and decontamination processes. It's going to take longer than you have taken before. Now, one of the things that we are recommending to the, our clients, our, our dental clients, is that if you have, if you're seeing fewer patients in a day and you're doing more dentistry per patient when and where that's appropriate and possible, you may need you may not need as many assistants perhaps as you have historically worked with doctors okay well don't let them go what you may consider if you are not working with an assistant for your hygienists you may want to consider having an assistant work with your hygienists at least during the time period or of her appointments when she is uh, has a handpiece in hand so that we can have improved suctioning. You're probably using some improved suctioning in, um, uh, in, in the hygiene room now anyway, um, improved filters and all the isolites and, and everything else that's gonna, we're gonna need to have in, in hygiene. Um, but you may wanna consider having an, one of these assistants assisting your hygiene, hygienist or hygienists during the time she has handpiece in hand to improve upon um, the filtering um, of aerosols. Uh, now, I didn't answer a question that I believe Dr. Halley asked about, or perhaps Dr. Greenwald, you asked about, about the examinations, about wanting to have an examination for those hygiene patients. I do believe those are still imperative because about 40 to 60 percent of a doctor's restorative or aesthetic dentistry is going to come right out of hygiene uh, because of the things I mentioned historically or just a few minutes ago. So I, I, I really hate to see you not doing those exams and either diagnosing or re-evaluating, re re re-educating and hopefully re-motivating that person, those people, to go ahead with necessary care. Um, could you, and so, so are, are you going to have to re, re, 
clothe? Probably so. Is that going to cost? Yes. Is it going to take time? Yes, it is. So again, what I would recommend you do is talk to your supply people and find the most convenient, most rapid, most cost effective way to do that. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know that I, ha I don't have the answer to that. And again, it changes constantly, daily, daily it changes. But what I'm going to say is that doing without the, the doctor's evaluation during the hygiene appointments is not a healthy option, not a healthy option for the patient. It's certainly not a healthy option for the practice because again, I ran over this slide very quickly, because again, you want about 30% of the total productivity of the practice coming from hygiene. You want about 40 to 60% of the doctor's total production coming from hygiene. And we want 85 to 90% of your active patient family actively involved in hygiene. So there's, there's so much that goes on in hygiene, we consider it the lifeblood of the dental practice. So we don't want to, um, we don't want to do anything that takes away from the hygiene program. And so if you added a few dollars to each hygiene appointment or pounds as it were, or whatever it may be, uh, rand to each appointment, would that keep people from coming to you? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Not if we're basing our practice on quality care, relationships with the patient, the, the little bit of increase in cost, will be far outweighed by the benefit of the service, the benefit to health, and the, and the quality of the relationship. And I, I've done this for a long time, and I wouldn't say that if I didn't totally believe it's true. Remember to delegate everything you can by the laws of your own country. Dele you want the dentist to do the things that only a dentist can do and delegate everything else according to the laws of your country. This is going to be absolutely imperative as you strive to, to make your practice more profitable. Remember you want to be productive in all that you do as productive as you can be, but you also want to look at those profit margins. It's going to be tough to be profitable over the next few months so we're going to have to strive to do that you want to make sure that the room is prepared before the doctor enters so assistants are going to have to be on their toes and changes are on the horizon so work together to practice 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 what we need to do in terms of any upcoming changes i don't want the first day you're opened for the for the team to be scrambling around figuring out what we need to do. Schedule some time before the door opens so that we know what we're doing so that we don't look um, like we're scrambling when the patients walk in. You, that will only cause them to be afraid. Wouldn't you agree? You have to look calm and well organized and ready. If you don't look ready, the people are gonna sense that, they're gonna see that, and that's gonna cause them to be afraid. I promise you that. The calmer you are, the calmer the patients will be. And that will lead to confidence in the patient, confidence in you. So I've already talked about proper sterilization, that goes without saying. And I've talked about charging for PPE and scheduling extra time for sterilization, I've talked about that. This, then I've talked about the hygiene assistant when the handpiece is being used. So I've talked about all of those things. Couple of other things, work with con infection control experts to make sure you're applying all mandates. Um, we did had a, an expert in infection control do a webinar for us on a Thursday evening. And by the next Monday, things had changed and we have to have another expert come in and, and the next week and do another one. I'm telling you. So do not think that you can do this once and it is over. So that's not a bad thing. You just keep learning, keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. Be a student of this constantly and then continue to study the updates again according to the mandates of your own government. Um, these, are, the, these are things you can do. Now let me quickly, in just a few minutes we have left, I, wanted, I promised I'd do this little bit on marketing. I, I just want to say the one, the one thing about, about financing and then I want to go into this marketing. 
There is financing available, uh, patient financing. And thanks to Dr. Greenwall and her wonderful Nicola for sending me information about a financing program that is in all of the countries, I believe, that are, be, that are represented in this webinar. I looked, I studied this today before we did this webinar. There is a, a financing company called Finance for the number four group. You probably all have heard of this. You can go on www.finance number four group.com and look them up they have joined with a very large worldwide financial conglomerate called Klarna K-L-A-R-N-A they are a Swedish bank they provide online financial services and their their group for dental services is called slice it and they are in i believe 17 countries including all of the countries represented in on this webinar and they are providing services of three or four or longer months for patients to finance their dentistry and the reason i believe this is imperative for you we have found it to be imperative all over uh, the United States for sure and in our own practice uh, because people may not be able to pay for your services in one felt swoop with one check or one with cash or with their bank cards. Bank cards are great by the way. Cash or check are great. Um, but people may need to spread the payments out and pay for that over a period of time in order to get the dentistry done because of their own financial situations. Well, great, let them. You will get paid, you will get your money, the patients will have the opportunity to pay it out over a period of time. Let me read this from the founder of this company. He's Brian Thompson, the founder and manager, managing director at Finance Four Group says this, dental work, can, can uh, eye tests and pet medicine can all stack up. When it comes to health, either our own or that of our furry friends, because I do provide vet care too, upfront costs should not hold people back from making the best choices. We chose a partner with, to partner with Klarna um, as they are next generation innovators in payments who can help us bring something different and exciting to the health sector. Far too many years, for too many years, patients have been asked to complete, uh, oh, excuse me, I just, I just lost it. Let me, let me see if I can get this back. I, 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 I just lost my own thing. What he was saying is patients have been asked to pay in large amounts and they couldn't do it. And so they joined with this company so patients could make long-term payment. He had a wonderful statement about that. I got it online. You can do the same thing. Please, if you are not already joined with this, consider this and then market this to your patients and let them know you need not be concerned about financing your dental care. Come to us for needed or desired dental care. Now we can help you finance your dental care. We have comfortable, convenient dental care, uh, dental financing right here in our practice. If the cost is a reason why people are not coming to your practice, you can offset a potential negative before the fact, and that will give you the advantage by offering a service to your patient in a wonderful, positive way. So remember that the telephone is the most important marketing tool you have in your practice. So write up scripts. Think of all the negative things that, or all the questions, not negative things. Think of all the questions a patient might present to you now and as you reopen and then write up scripts that you believe would answer the questions in a positive constructive way and then practice these scripts as a team put your own words into it and say it in your own way but you want linkage communication where the right hand is saying about the same thing as the left hand is saying so that the message that your patient or patients are hearing is similar uh, and what you don't want is for someone on your team to say, oh, well, I don't, I don't know what we're doing about that. I don't know. You'll have to ask Kathy. No, no. You want everybody to be able to at least say the, a constructive 
message to a patient. Now, I might not make a financial arrangement, but I want to know how to pass that question on to, let's say, Teresa, the person you see in this photograph. Mrs. Jones, you ask a wonderful question, and I'm so glad that you asked that question about our patient financing program. Let me transfer this call to Teresa, our financial coordinator. She's excellent, and I'm sure she'll be able to discuss this with you and answer any questions you might have. So may I place you on hold for just a moment while I transfer your call to Teresa? And I'm gonna train. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna know any question that or I think I'm gonna try my best to know any question I might be asked, and I'm gonna be able to answer it graciously. Grace is the is the call here. So let's go on quickly. Uh, and, and I'm gonna just gonna throw out a quick couple of things. You want to track new patient phone calls? Who scheduled those appointments? Who broke any new patients who schedule but then break them? And and then. If somebody does schedule a new a new appointment with you, a new patient appointment with you, how much dentistry was diagnosed? How much was accepted? And then I always want to know the referral source. You, I hope that your biggest source of new patients are referrals. And here's your website. Yes, you want a great website. You want customer service messages on in your website, and certainly. We want it to be about corona, the coronavirus and to address that in a constructive way, as I mentioned earlier, to find who you are and how committed you are to taking care of your patients and, and their families, as well as you and your team and all of your families. Use copy that promotes you and the services you, you provide uh, and cater to your target market, whatever your target market is. You want to have search engine optimization so that you appear on the first page. If somebody goes to their uh, internet, you want your name to appear on the first page. You want patient or you focused copy. That means you want, to, you will receive this. You will experience this. You and your family can know that. Always talk about you and your family. In, in the in the messages use very use little or no we or our or us or our doctor uh, you want to always talk about the patient if you want the patient to do something ask them call our practice ask us about use action words create discover call ask other things about your website contact information should be clearly visible in the top right corner of every page Avoid words like money, price, and dollars. Instead, use words like finance, fee, investment. And remember to, on in your website, talk about, we provide comfortable financing right here in our practice. We provide um, affordable financing in our practice. Those kinds of words. Include professional quality photographs of each team member individually. Individually, not as a group, because you may have team members change. Uh, do a photograph of your doctor that represents his or her personality and style. And, and marketing information says you should show the doctor's hands. Use photographs of actual patients as opposed to stock images. Here's some examples of, of websites that we've created. We have a marketing company within the umbrella of Jameson Management. These are actual photographs. They have testimonials from patients. And this is all copy that is a your smile is a, is a, is a gift. You know, and so it's all about the you, it's all about the patient. Another example, very easy for the patient to maneuver through and uh, again, attractive. That's again, that's the doctor's patient. And um, very easy, easy, easy to go through the phone number at the upper right hand corner. That's again, you want the 43 and three rule. You hope that 40% that of the people bounce they have a 40 percent bounce rate 40 percent bounce off 60 percent stay three pages that they visit at least three pages which you think they might go through a lot more they don't so you want to have interesting things that keep your people on your website a long time and that you want them to stay at least three minutes you think they'd stay an hour they won't but three minutes is a long time for somebody to stay on a website the goal is to get the patient to pick up the phone and call you so you want it to be interesting, beautiful, easy to maneuver, easy to navigate. And the goal is for them to call you. The goal is for them to call you. Um, we like to send a welcome packet. 
Um, you can do this digitally. You can do it in hard copy and digitally both. Get information. And remember, you want this to be digital because you'd like for them to fill out their paperwork and get it back to you digitally. But you can send it to a hard copy as well. But the digital, you know, their patient information sheet, the health the information sheet, their health history form, a brochure. And in this information, you should update this. Update information currently, maybe a newsletter that talks about um, the coronavirus. And remember, if you have a patient communication system, hopefully you do, like Smile Reminder or Demand Force or Weave or any of those, whatever you're using, these are easy to do. Stay in contact with your patients on a regular basis in a very positive way and do newsletters about the COVID-19, do special mailings, do letters, do whatever. Don't be afraid to stay in touch with your patients on a very regular basis with positive, constructive information. Use Facebook, use Instagram, use Twitter, uh, stay in touch with people. Um, the more you stay in touch with them in a constructive way, the better off you are. 80-20 rule on social media, 80% valuable content and relationship building, and 20% practice promotion, Do, post photos, post like my client I just told you about. They just, the day they opened, they did a post with all of them dressed in all of their, all of their PPE very proudly. Check for posts by fans daily and respond within one business day and post something three to five times per week. Promote internally and place your logo on all marketing materials. Support charity causes, I'm sure, I know in the Oklahoma Dental Association, our uh, dental association gathered a lot of their, our own PPE, and we donated it to hospitals that were desperate for it. And what a great thing for our own people to do to serve our healthcare needs in our own state. So remember the success of your relationships, your practice, and your career balance on your ability to communicate effectively. So with that, let me see if there's any questions that I can answer. I went over much of it quickly, but um, Kathy, so there was some about the um, relating the the um, hygiene exams created a few questions, um, and so it was basically how how we're going to get it to work really. Um, so let me just see what there was. There was two. I, I think you're going to have to I schedule think, more time, more time yeah. in the hygiene exam. You're just going to have to schedule more time than you have before. Uh, if you value the hygiene evaluations, which I do, you're going to see fewer hygiene patients in a day. You're going to schedule more time into those appointments. But remember this, that if dentistry is coming into the doctor's restorative area, that the the less productivity that you may accomplish from the hygiene appointments will transfer into increased productivity in the doctor's area. It will balance out or there'll be an increase. But I you think cannot you said, cannot compromise you cannot compromise the hygiene appointments. From from like what we've learned with you and what I've definitely learned as well is and I talk like a lot about it is also utilizing your hygienist and your therapist to their full potential as well. So making sure they're working to full scope. That's right. Yeah. Because remember also, and Diane, you are such a pro, we want, yes, the, the, the perio therapist doing perio, uh, such a valuable part of a patient's care. It's such a productive part of a practice. And then for the hygienist to educate patients, uh, of course, the hygienist can't diagnose, but you certainly can pre-diagnose and educate and support the doctor's diagnosis. And that is so valuable. And we, we, we cannot, we just cannot shortchange that. So uh, if it were my practice, I would schedule more time for our hygienist uh, hygiene appointments. And if I, if I see one less hygiene patient a day and I give my hygienist more time per appointment, so be it. If I need to charge yes. a little bit more per appointment, I would do that. So the question, Kathy, is um, the question is about the costs. So the, what is there a cost um, in the ADA or the fee schedules for the PPE? People want to know. So you've got your normal exam. You've got you've got you've got. Let's say you're doing a hygiene exam. So the hygienist has added PPE. The dentist has added PPE, and um, Will you, there have been questions about will you need to hire an extra staff member 
I think we will because we'll need more. We we'll need one person delegated just to do sterilization in the high, in the sterilization room. So all those build up the cost, and we wanted to look at the cost in terms of how we schedule. We were planning to keep the hygiene fees the same, but add the PPE costs, and all our appointments will go from an hour's a hygiene appointment to an hour and a half. Where we, because of the time that we'll need to to do all that, we are we are running a time and motion study next week with our team. We're going to work out how long it's going to take us to put on the PPE, how long it will take to walk through, and all those things. We're going to run that through. So could you come back to cost just to help us in terms of uh, calculating fees for this time? Yes, and good for you for doing the time and motion study. Uh, I, there's two things about that. Good for you for doing that. Do that, and I and I would recommend that you do that for a month and then come back and do another one in a month and see if it remains the same or if you see that that has changed. You may find that your time and motion study changes, and if so, so be it. That's great. It doesn't have to stay the same forever. You may find it does stay the same, but it might you might shorten it you might find that you get faster as you get more used to it that may indeed happen so good for you for doing it next week come back in a month and see if it's still the same um, but if you're going to add that much time and if you're going to add a team member and you are adding quite a bit of extra PPE you have to transfer the additional cost to the patient you cannot absorb those extra costs. No business can take on, I don't care what the business is, no business can take on that much additional cost and not transfer those costs onto the consumer. In our case, the consumer is the patient. So I think it is appropriate to transfer the cost to the patient. You can, now it depends on the country. And again, in America, we're just now going through this, whether or not the American Dental Association will add a code where there will be a, a code where there is a char there will be a charge for the PPE, a standalone code and a standalone fee. We don't know that yet. I'm okay with somebody doing that if they, if they want to. There's nothing that says that you can't just do that. I'm okay with that. Or another option is for someone to decide that they can, that they just add X amount to the different procedures. Like you might add X amount to the profi, add X amount to the radiographs, add X amount to um, fluoride, add X amount to the perio. So add uh, a few pounds in your case to each procedure where it adds up to 25 pounds or per hygiene appointment or something, whatever it is. So the first thing you need to do is find out how much is it going to be per patient of additional cost and then divide that by the number of patients you're seeing in a day to see what your additional costs are going to be and then figure what would be the best way for us to do that to charge a fee per patient, just a flat fee and charge a and make up a code for it and just charge that much, or raise your fees X amount of pounds per procedure and so that it adds up to the appropriate total per appointment. Does that make sense, Dr. Greenwald? Yeah, I think we, we are looking at a fee. I mean, I know it's difficult to say, but I think patients would be um, absolutely fine to pay the PPE at the moment because they want to know that they want, that are going to be treated safely. I think so, so too. Twenty-five dollars, thirty pounds, something like that, is, I, the, is the fee that we are looking at. Just I one more question. So one more and, question. And I, and I would, I would, I would actually preempt that. I would say very graciously and very proudly in my marketing, in a special letter that I send to patients, telling them your start date. If it were my practice, I would send a letter. Or, or, or a digital newsletter or a digital announcement to all of my patients. And I would tell them of the start date, welcome them back. And I would very proudly speak about what we're doing in our practice to protect them and write the letter in a very, not apologetically, but very proudly tell them how hard you've studied 
of the latest and very best in protection methodologies for them and for their families and for you and for your families. And, and you don't need to go into all the details, but say we are abiding by the recommendations of the British Dental Association or whatever country you're from. And, and the, you're gonna abide by them to the, very, to the nth degree. And, and again, stress the benefits. Remember all behavior is driven by what's in this for me. People wanna know what are the benefits. And, and I agree with you, Dr. Greenwald, people will be, and, and as a result, our costs have gone up. Our, our cost to provide this service will be approximately 25 pounds per appointment. And we are going to be applying the 25 pounds per appointment as of July the 4th and, and, and from that time forward. We wanted to let you know this. We're very proud to, to announce this to you because we're very proud of the services we're providing. And then people will be informed. People want to know something before the fact. And again, I agree with you. People will be happy to pay that if they know they're safe. As I mentioned at the outset, what, pe what we want to offset is the fear, the fear and the anxiety. It's the fear and the anxiety that will keep people away more than anything else. What you want to do is secure your patient family. And then as new people come in, you want to be able to speak to that and address that or have written materials to send to them early. If somebody calls you as a potential new patient, then you want that business team ready to send something to them immediately. Even if a new patient doesn't schedule immediately, I want to access their email to the very best of my ability. And I wanna send them an email right off the bat with information, very positive, welcoming, constructive information that talks about welcoming them and the benefits of coming to your practice, but also how profoundly interested you are in keeping people safe. Because you'll win out in the end. If they're shoppers, I, don't, I like shoppers because they're looking for a dental home and I want them to settle in your dental home. So um, there's a question from Dr. Paula Richardson about Hello, Dr. Um, those, the, the screens. You know, some people are putting plastic screens. Yes. So the yes. patient, especially we have a duty to protect our reception teams. Yes. And so yes. an admin teams from direct contact, we're trying to work out if the reception teams should wear uh, um, a gown over their over their business attire or they should have a visor or should they have these these new plastic screens that you um, establish that you set up you know how should we for the reception team keep them safe what i've been seeing in the medical offices that i've been in in the last week is the plastic screens and masks i and some are wearing um gowns Mm, I'm trying to think in my head if they've all were wearing gowns. Yes, gowns, masks, and screens. What about is it? Yeah, gowns, masks, and screens. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's yeah, not well, it, and now, and it's hard to talk on the phone with a mask. But that's what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Now, I have not seen, and I'm going to turn to Amy. Amy's sitting, have you heard any mandates about that, Amy, for the business team? Um, no, not, I mean, it's changing all the time, but, like, people are doing tape, um, like, to show where six feet, where you need to stand when you're, if you're checking them out, where they need to stand, where they're not too close. So right. there's social distancing, like they were participating in social distancing and put a sign on right. there. Right, Amy was saying that there, people are putting signs up on the, on the, plastic that we are we are practicing social distancing and and then they're putting tape on the floor so that people know that they need to stand back a certain distance so next question about families because um if we um, normally uh, the whole family would come together um and and wait so what would you advise now especially in school holidays well all the schools are on holiday but how would you advise seeing children and for hygiene examinations and how would you advise seeing families? The, for, for, the, for the adults, for the adults, they're only allowing the patient to come in, not accompanied by somebody who's not a patient. If they are, uh, if, if people are, are patients, they can come in 
but you know, people are spreading out the patients. They still have to spread out with the, with the pediatric practices. Amy, have you seen? I, I don't, Brenda would know. I, don't know. Uh, I can't, I can't. But they have to still social distance. They can't see as many kids the patient flow so it they, they have to abide by the same guidelines have to abide by the same guidelines a parent would have to accompany a child but i'm sure they are not bringing the whole family right. but probably bringing one child at a time yeah. and it depends on the age of the child too cooper leslie got his late braces removed and rachel sat in the car yeah so depending on the age of the child yeah amy was just saying that it depends on the age of the child one of our actually a relative who is probably 10 mm -hmm. had his braces removed or maybe older than that had his no. braces removed but the mother had to sit in the car yeah so so these are the, the safety issues for the children and and for um for the team practicing and you mentioned that when you went for an, uh, a medical examination they ask you to bring a mask so you were wearing your own mask when you yes. arrived so far every place i've been in about three different medical practices doing various things and uh they have all asked me to bring my own mask yeah so they did, not, they did not provide the mask they're asking you to bring your own mask hmm. So we, we're looking at that and all the non-aerosol generating as well as whether we should put a, a, a protective gown on the patient. Another question is going to the toilet because um, many dental practices don't want to have the patients going to the toilet because of the sterilizing and all the other things. Um, have, you, have you come across that? Yes. What do, you, what, do you, what do you suggest on that? Do you communicate that? prior in your emails and your text and the communications that Kathy's outlined, you're going to communicate that and say, as with your patient experience, a few things might be, will be different this time. And you'll outline that so they know before, so they go before. And then um, so some people have done like signs, like, you know, this, whatever lavatory restroom is closed, um, you know, for your safety and the health of all patients and a, a, some signage to put that in front of the restroom. Did you hear Amy? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. No. That, that's very wise information. Yes. Um, yeah. I think that, um, yeah, the, all the, so basically in terms of admin, it's going to be an extra half an hour per patient with all the admin that is required for the pre-appointment, um, the, the post-appointment, but the pre-appointment to get everything online, all the questionnaires online, um, everything to be done digitally. I think in terms of the reception team, each patient, managing each patient is going to take longer. It, 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 I don't know that it will. It, it may take more for the admin team in terms of getting things to the people in advance. But because if the patients are cooperative, and, and I've been getting very wonderful calls from the administrative teams reminding me and making sure that I have everything that I need, and I'm a very conscientious patient, and so I did what I was supposed to do. And so then it was very quick. I called when I got there. They called me when, I, when the room was ready. I went up and I went right into the treatment room, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. So everything went very quickly once I, I was there. So the admin team spent very little time with me, actually, very little time with me. Okay, excellent. And so again, in terms of the fin making financial arrangements, as we discussed earlier, you know, it'll be probably the same, I think. Mm -hmm. So I want to say thank you very much. I'm sure you have some closing comments you want to give to everybody. Um, I, we said that we will put on the, res when we res send back to everybody who participated, we will need a feedback form from them and we will send um, a certificate. Um, your resources in terms of your website, Kathy, and um, the 25 systems for managing those those systems to, to do as a start. Um, we will send that to everybody. Do you, do you want to have some closing comments before I say yes. thanks? And, uh, and thanks for mentioning the book. We, we, we're going to be sending some of the books, of course, at your request of the Success Strategies books to, to you uh, at your office. And uh, they are very, I always tell people, I said they're worth a million dollars because if people will do what's in the book, it's, it's worth a million dollars. And, and uh, the 25 systems are in there. And then we detail how to do that. So we'll be looking forward to getting those across, across the ocean. And uh, so thank you for mentioning those. And it was a delight to do that book with you.
And uh, so that, and, and again, we, there's so much, there's so much to cover. There's so many things. Hopefully we'll be doing more of this as things progress. It's, uh, this is, these are very interesting and difficult times. No, the world has never gone through anything quite like this. While there have been uh, pandemics before, uh, there was, a, there was, but it's been a century since there was a, a pandemic of this kind. We've had SARS and we've had Ebola, but the, the last pandemic was in 2000, I mean, in 1918, wasn't it? 1918. So it's been, none, none of us were alive at that time. So this has been a very um, interesting and trying time and our business is being closed. But I think the world has stuck together in many ways and it's been beautiful to see people reaching out to help one another and that's what we're doing today is reaching out to one another to help one another and I appreciate all of you doing that as a group from around the world reaching out as brothers and sisters and saying hey we're in this profession together we're here as colleagues um, committed to helping our patients and we do that through helping one another. So Dr. Greenwald, thank you. Diane, thank you. Thanks thank to you, Amy Perry for helping me. We really are grateful to all of you. Thank so, you. Thank you. I want to say thank, thank you so much, well. Kathy. Thank you for giving your time today. Um, we're just looking at the questions and the questions are please do more. We yeah. have I've, I've saved the chat. I've saved it, so I'll forward it on to you. So right. We could it. probably do a webinar just on the chat. How does that sound? <laughs> Absolutely, because the questions are excellent and they're very topical, um, critical questions. And so I'm sure there will be more questions as well. That. Thank you so much. And let's look at doing something sooner rather than later. I know it's a very challenging time for all of us. And so um, the resilience building, everything you mentioned, that's a very good new topic. Crisis management and resi resilience building for a new book in forms of what we have to be doing now. It's been exceptionally helpful. You've yeah. covered so many aspects. I know it was quick, but we all had so many questions we wanted to cover. Excellent information, very practical advice. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And thank you so much for reaching out to us and helping us today. And we look forward to seeing you again. And thank you to everybody for participating. I hope you find it interesting, interactive session. And we look forward to seeing you again. Stay well, stay healthy. Yes. Um, stay in touch. That is the, the motto. So thank you so much, Mandy. With much thank appreciation. you. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Everyone. Blessings thank on all. So Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. There we go.